Aging and disease are biochemical processes that happen over many decades. So if we track and optimize well-established biomarkers of organ and systemic function, can aging and disease risk be slowed? So apologies to those who have heard this a trillion times, but that's the central premise of the channel. And with that in mind, about two weeks ago, I blood tested for the fourth time in 2024. And note that this is blood test number 52 since 2015. So what's my biological age? And we'll see that here. This is using Dr. Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator as a metric of biological age. And if you have blood test data and you want to measure your own biological age using this test, there's a downloadable free Excel link in the video's description. So when entering these nine biomarkers and chronological age, I get a biological age of 33.8 years, which is 17.5 years younger than my chronological of 51.3 years. But note that I've highlighted CRP there. I messed up on the order. I ordered CRP and not HSCRP. So I actually don't know what HSCRP is because the CRP test only measures less than three milligrams per liter. It doesn't get as close to under 0.3 milligrams per liter. So that, that's an imputed data. Now, I think it's a fair guess to say that HSCRP may be 0.3 milligrams per liter. As for 17 conse consecutive tests before this test, it was less than 0.3 milligrams per liter. That said, it's not a guarantee. It could be a bit higher, thereby reducing the 17.5 year reduction relative to my chronological age. And rather than just looking at data into, entered into a spreadsheet, blood test data, screenshots of the lab report are coming up in about a minute. Now, as I mentioned for most biomarkers and most biomarker testing, it's important not to get too high or too low for the results as it's just one test. So with that in mind, for more context, let's take a look at biological age results, all biological age results using PhenoAge since 2018, as I have 33 tests over that time period. And that's what we can see here. So when I first started testing 2018 to 2019, I had three tests with an average of 36.1 years. And then in 2020, 2021, I tested 12 times, six times each year with an average age of or an average biological age using phenoage of 35.6 years for each of those two years for both 2020 and 2021. Then my best year to date, 2022, 33.8 years. It got a bit worse in 2023 with an average of 34.7 years. And thus far, after four tests in 2024, I'm off to a great start. Once again, pushing that lower limit of my best data at 33.7 years. So I would never claim to reverse aging, but with this approach, it should be clear, at least since 2018, that at best, I may be slowing biological age. All right, as I mentioned, this is data entered into a spreadsheet. Let's take a look at the blood test result, uh, blood test report, as it's important to not only focus on a few biomarkers, but to look at as many as possible, as I mentioned, as many uh, biomarkers of as many organ systems as possible. So let's check out the full blood test report. So starting with total testosterone at 965, this is relatively youthful, so no reason for concern there. But we can see that free testosterone is on the relatively low side towards the lower end of the range. And that's particularly uh, because of SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. You can see that I'm almost three times higher than the reference range. Now, SHBG is an interesting biomarker. On the one hand, it increases during aging, and higher levels are associated with an increased Alzheimer's disease incident risk. And I'll put the link for those videos in the video's description. But on the other hand, it's two times higher for people on CR relative to people on a standard diet. And it's possibly associated with insulin sensitivity, which suggests it could relatively high levels could be a good thing, especially when considering that calorie restriction is probably the gold standard for extending lifespan in a variety of animal models. So I'll, I'll have more uh, insight into the SHBG and free testosterone and what may be optimal in a future video. All right, going further, we've got HDL at 54. The optimal range for HDL is 50 to 60. I covered that in an earlier video on the channel. And more importantly, I've had issues with relatively low HDL. So in contrast, HDL has been greater than or equal to 50 milligrams per deciliter for nine tests in a row with an average over those nine tests of about 55 milligrams per deciliter. In contrast, for the 43 tests since 2015, it was about 10 milligrams per deciliter less. And rather than just looking at two different groups of data, we can compare them statistically 
And when using a two sample t-test, we can see that I've been able to significantly improve HDL over the past nine tests, about the past 15 months relative to the earlier data since 2015. All right, onto the second page of the report. We can see that homocysteine is still a weak spot. 10.8 micromolar is age expected, which is a dirty word in my lingo because I want to have everything youthful and not age expected. Now for this test, I uh, tested the uh, hypothesis that increasing protein intake would lower homocysteine. And that's in part because a relatively higher protein intake in my data is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine. Now I decided to focus on branch chain amino acids and I supplemented with five grams per day, which is a 50% increase relative to my average intake because there's data in a Parkinson's animal model where branch chain amino acids are fermented by uh, gut bacteria, uh, reducing neuro neurodegeneration, potentially by reducing homocysteine. So I decided to test that hypothesis, thinking that I may be just deficient in BCAAs and limited in terms of gut bacterial fermentation into propionate. Uh, but as we can see with five grams of BCAAs per day, that didn't impact homocysteine at all. All right, we can also see glucose, even though Levine's phenoage was a relatively youthful 17 and a half years younger than my chronological, my glucose level for this test was my second worst over those 52 tests since 2015. So I intend on bringing that down on further tests. On the other hand, creatinine is close to my lowest value, which is good news because creatinine levels increase during aging. Now, creatinine is proportional to muscle mass, and it's hard to believe that I lost muscle mass in, you know, the, in about a month since the last test. So a lower creatinine level could be indicative of better kidney function. And in support of that, we can see that uric acid levels are close to the lowest end that I've had over all my tests, and uric acid levels increase in the presence of poor kidney function. So that I get a reduction in creatinine, which suggests better kidney function, and a reduction for uric acid, potentially suggesting better clearance systemically, lowering uric acid. Th those are two markers suggestive of better kidney function for this test. All right, and then we can also see thyroid hormones, which I'm gonna track for every test going forward because my free T3 to free T4 ratio is a bit lower than I'd like. And I covered that in an earlier video, which would be in the right corner. So for this test, I increased Brazil nut intake to get close to the tolerable upper limit of 400 micrograms per day of selenium because selenium is a required cofactor for conversion of T4 into T3. And, and based on that experiment, I expected to see higher free T3 with an increase in dietary selenium, but it barely moved. It went from 2.3 to 2.4 for free T3, whereas free T4 stayed the same as it was for the April test. So I, get a, I got a very marginal increase for the free T3 to free T4 ratio. Nonetheless, I increased Brazil nut intake for only 16 days. I'm going to keep that relatively high and aim for that 400 microgram per day target until the next test, which will probably be uh, sometime in late July. And then we'll see if that makes an impact with a longer duration uh, of doing the experiment uh, sometime then. All right, and then we can also see the white blood cell count at 3.6 is towards the lower side of the range. But in an earlier video on the channel, we saw that White blood cells in the 3.5 to 6 range is associated with the longest life expectancy relative to 6,000 or higher. So that's potentially good news. But I find it more instructive to focus not on the total white blood cell counts, but their distributions, including neutrophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, as they account for more than 95% of total white blood cell counts. And whereas neutrophils and monocytes increase during aging, lymphocytes decrease during aging. So it's possible to have no change in white blood cells during aging but have increases for the neutrophils and monocytes while the lymphocytes are decreasing. And in line with that hypothesis, we can see that my lymphocytes, which were never a problem, always somewhere around relatively youthful, 2000 prior to this year, 2000 also being associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. For the past few tests, they've been closer to 1500 or less. So that's on the priority list for bringing them back to 2000. Uh, stay tuned for that in an upcoming video for how I did it. And then onto page three, where we can see that it, similar to the white blood cell story, if I only focused on that and didn't look at the distribution, you know, neutrophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes, I would miss that lymphocytes have declined. And knowing that they decline during aging, that's going in the wrong direction. If I only focused on the lymphocyte percentage, which is relatively youthful based on age-related plots, they decline during aging, the lymphocyte percentage declines during aging, I would miss 
that, you know, the, the once again, I would miss the lymphocytes being low if I only focused on lymphocyte percentage and total white blood cell counts. So it's important to look at the details, you know, under the hood. And then we can see how I messed up C-reactive protein. That's not the HSCRP measurement. As you can see, it's less than three milligrams per liter. HSCRP, the lower lim limit of detection is 0.3 milligrams per liter. And then last but not least, and still a weak spot, is DHEA sulfate. Although I've been able to keep it relatively stable for the past two years, which is good news because it declines during aging, I've had values about twice as high 15 years ago. So the goal is to get back to that or to get my system to get it back to that. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon, where I do blood test consults. We've also got a whole bunch of discount links that you may be interested in, including discount links for epigenetic testing, NAD quantification, or microbiome composition, at-home metabolomics, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes ApoB, but also GrimAge, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Dietrine brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.